This lecture is part of an online course on Lie groups and will be about integration on a Lie group G. Um, so the basic result about integration is that G has a left invariant measure. Um, and left invariant means that if you take the measure of a set U, then this is equal to the measure of the set um, G times U whenever G is in G. Here U is, an, say, an open subset of G and mu is a measure. And um, I'm saying it's left invariant because we actually need to distinguish that from being a right invariant measure, which would say mu, the measure of a set mu, u is equal to mu of u multiplied by g on the right. And for many groups, left invariant measures the same as right invariant measures, but in a few minutes we'll see an example of a group where, where these are actually different. So a typical example is just Lebesgue measure on the group G, which is just r to the n, an n-dimensional vector space. The usual measure on r to the n is um, left invariant, means, meaning it's invariant under translations. Um, so I'm going to give three different methods of showing the existence of a, a measure on a Lie group. The first is to cheat a bit and just use the result that any locally compact group has a Haar measure, which is um, left invariant. And moreover, this Haar measure is unique up to multiplication by a constant. And Lie groups are locally compact groups, so in particular this applies to them. Um, so that's fine as an existence theorem, but doesn't really help if you actually want to calculate with the measure. Um, however, there are a few applications of integration where you don't actually need to know exactly what the measure is. You need to know just that it exists. So, so here's an example of an application of integration where you don't need to know the measure explicitly. And the application is that finite dimensional representations of compact groups, or compact Lie groups, doesn't really matter which, are completely reducible. Um, completely reducible means you can write them as sums of irreducible representations, meaning they, they, they don't have any sub-representations apart from naught and the whole thing. So in other words, if you've got an exact sequence, naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to zero of representations, then this splits, meaning there's a morphism from C to B, which uh, identifies B with A, plus c. Um, as an example of a representation that doesn't split, we can just take g to be isomorphic to the reals. We identify it with these matrices acting on R2. And then you see we have this sequence of representations of g. And g acts trivially on R and R because that just corresponds to the fact there's a 1 there. But it acts non-trivially on R squared. So you can't write R squared as a sum of two um, sub-representations, each of which is trivial. So for non-compact groups, you can't always write finite dimensional representations as a sum of irreducible ones. If g is compact, we can because all finite dimensional representations are unitary. That means they've got an invariant um, skew symmetric um, positive definite bilinear form on them. In particular, the, the invariance is um, important. So, I mean, you can obviously put a non invariant form on just by choosing any random Hermitian form. Um, and the point is, we can make any form, Hermitian form invariant, by averaging over the group G. And we can average over the group G because we can integrate over G. And averaging over a compact group G is more or less the same as integrating a function over the group. So, 
So any representation can be made unitary, and then if we've got an exact sequence, 0 goes to A goes to B goes to C goes to 0, we can simply write B is equal to A plus the orthogonal complement of A. And since this form is invariant, the orthogonal complement is also invariant under G, so B splits as a sum of sub-representations. Well, um, most of the time when you want to do integration over a group, you really actually need to know what the, what the integral is. Um, so the second method um, is to use an n form and um, so I'll, I'll start by just recalling um, what the relation is between n forms on a group G and a measure on G. So, so n forms are sort of related to measures, they're not exactly the same. Um, so an n form, uh, here the dimension of G is equal to n of course, is something that looks in local coordinates like um, some function f of x1 to xn times dx1 up to dxn. Um, um, for example, the big measure on r to the n, you would just take f to be um, the identity, f to be 1 and dx1 up to dxn to be the coordinate functions. Well, n forms do not exactly correspond to measures. First of all, um, there are some measures which can't be represented by integrating n forms because they might have singularities, like they might be Dirac delta functions or something, but we will ignore that problem. The other minor problem that we occasionally need to worry about is orientations. The point is that an n form doesn't quite give you a measure. For example, suppose we want to have a measure on the reals and we want to integrate a function f from 0 to 1. So we just write integral from 0 to 1 of f of x dx, right? Here we've got a 1 form and we can just integrate it. Well, the problem is we can also write integral of 1 to 0 of f of x dx and this is equal to minus that. Um, or possibly plus that, depending on your conventions. Um, because the point is, in order to integrate over f over this interval, we've got to choose a direction to integrate along. If we integrate in this direction, um, it's not the same as integrating the n-form in the other direction. So um, we need to choose an orientation on the group G in order to integrate it. And that's okay because all the groups are orientable and it's easy to see that because we can just choose an orientation at the identity of G and then just translate this to all other points of G using left translation and that gives a consistent orientation of the whole um, group G. So that's no problem. Um, well, it's not, there's just one little problem left. There are actually two orientations. And most of the time this doesn't really matter, but occasionally if you're using orientation reversing automorphisms of a group, then you run into slight sign problems. For instance, if you take g equals the reals, then if you map x to minus x, it takes dx to minus dx, but it takes Lebesgue measure to Lebesgue measure without a change of sign. So when we have an orientation reversing automorphism, you sort of pick up a strange sign when you, when you um, try and compare n forms with measures. Um, there's an example of this um, with Jacobians in multivariable calculus. You remember the Jacobian is given by some determinant of some matrix with entries d, f, i over d, x, j. Um, and you have to take the absolute value of the determinant um, rather than the determinant itself. And the reason you have to take the absolute value is because of this, this sign that appears when you reverse orientations. If, if, if you want the Jacobian to correspond to a measure, you don't want it to change sign when you change your orientation. Um, so anyway, we're going to more or less ignore this problem about orientations from now on because most of the time for Lie groups it doesn't really matter. Um, so that gives the second method of um, giving 
a measure on a group, you just choose a left invariant n form and you do that by choosing the n form at the identity and then just translating it by left translation to everywhere on G. So the third method of doing this is to write down an explicit n form on G. And of course you have to do this um, individually for each Lie group you're working with. So what I'm going to do now is to give some examples of this. So first of all we have some trivial examples. Um, so for Rn we just take the usual n form d1x1 up to dxn and this just gives Lebesgue measure. Um, if we take a discrete group G we can just use counting measure. Um, for a slightly less trivial example let's take the positive real numbers under multiplication. So we want a measure that's invariant. Well we could try dx. Well that's no good because left translation means we multiply x by a. So if we map x to ax and this becomes dax which is equal to a dx which is not equal to dx. So that's no good. So instead we try dx over x and dax over ax is now equal to dx over x. So this is invariant under left translation and we're fine. <coughs> Notice that if we look at um, negative reals as well we've got to be a little bit careful about signs and we would usually use dx divided by the absolute value of x instead in order to make this positive for the negative reals. Although as I said this depends a little bit on how you decide to orient the negative real numbers. So one case when this measure turns up is in something like the gamma function. So you know the gamma function is usually defined as the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus t t to the s minus 1 dt. And you may have looked at this and wondered what on earth this rather annoying factor of minus 1 is doing there. Um, if it wasn't there this would just be the same as the factorial. So it's really quite irritating that it's in there. Um, and one reason for putting it in is that it's the um, it's really the invariant measure on the group of positive reals. So what you're doing is you're integrating this function with respect to harm measure on the positive reals, which isn't quite the same as Lebesgue measure on the on the, on the real numbers. Um, OK, well we've been talking a lot about left invariant measures and it's about time we came across a measure group where left invariant was different from right invariant. And the simplest example of this is the group consisting of all matrices of this form. So it's the set of all matrices with x greater than 0. And I'm going to take x greater than 0 because if x is less than 0 we get various sign problems. Um, and if I allow x to be less than 0 I'll probably get a sign wrong somewhere so I'm just going to restrict the positive x. And we can identify this with the half plane consisting of um, points in the plane with positive x coordinate. And the product of these is given by a b x y equals a x a y plus b. Now let's find a left invariant measure. Well how about dx dy? Well this is no good because multiplication by a b does not fix it. What does it do? It multiplies it by the Jacobian. So for the Jacobian we, we need a, a lot of partial derivatives. We've got the derivative of ax with respect to um, x and um, the derivative of ay plus b with respect to x and we also need the derivative of ax with respect to y and we need the derivative of ay plus b with respect to y. And if you work out this determinant it's just a squared. So when you multiply by this by the element a b on the left it expands it by a factor of a squared. So to get rid of that we just have to divide it by the square of something. So 
we, the invariant measure is now going to be dx dy over x squared. We're putting x squared rather than a squared there because, um, well, if, you know, I always get very confused when I try and work out why you change a to x, but anyway. Um, so uh, um, this is the left invariant Haar measure on G. So, um, um, well, what about right invariant measures? Well, well, well suppose we look at um, the, what, what happens if we multiply by a, b on the right. So um, um, right multiplication takes um, x, y to a, x, b, x plus y. And um, here the Jacobian is now just a, not a squared. So the invariant measure is going to be dx dy over x. So this is, this is the right invariant measure. And you can see it's definitely different from the left invariant measure, which has an x squared in here. Um, so you have to be a bit careful about distinguishing between left invariant and right invariant measures in general. Um, so now let's do an example where G is, let's take the general linear group in two dimensions over the reals. So we can think of this as the matrices A, B, C, D with determinant not equal to zero. And again, we can try um, the, the, the left invariant measure is just dA, dB, dC, dD, divided by the Jacobian of the map taking x to A, B, C, D times x. And the Jacobian of this is quite easy to work out because um, on R squared, a matrix A, B, C, D um, multiplies volumes by the determinant of a, b, c, d, or rather its absolute value. And we can write two by two matrices um, of R squared as the sum of two copies of R squared as, as, a, as a representation of GL2. So on this, a, b, c, d multiplies volumes by the determinant of a, b, c, d, whoops, all squared. So the left invariant measure is now going to be d a, d b, d c, d d, divided by um, the determinant of a, b, c, d, squared. So this is the left invariant measure on the general linear group. And in fact, in this particular case, it's the same as the right invariant measure. And the general linear group in n variables is similar, except of course you put an n up here because um, n by n matrices are a sum of n copies of Rn. Um, now let's have a couple of rather easy examples. If we take the non-zero complex numbers under multiplication, we see that z goes to z times z1 multiplies volumes or rather areas by the absolute value of z squared. So the measure is now going to be dx dy over x squared plus y squared, where z is written as x plus i y, and x squared plus y squared is the absolute value of z squared. So this is the left invariant and of course right invariant measure on the non-zero complex numbers. We can do quaternions the same way. So quaternions can be written as a plus bi plus cj plus dk. And now we can try and figure out um, how much does a quaternion multiply volumes by, and we see that multiplication by a plus bi plus cj plus dk multiplies volumes by 
a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared all squared as you can easily verify if you do some little calculations with, with quaternions. So the invariant measure is um, dA times dB times dC times dD and well I guess you can see why people don't often use d as a variable when they're doing multivariable calculus and we divide this by a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared all squared which is the which is the Jacobian. Well I've been kind of cheating in all these examples because all the examples above um, are just um, open subsets of r to the n and this makes it rather easy to work out what the left invariant measure is because we can just write it in terms of Jacobians. So um, let me do um, one example of a group that isn't an open subset of r to the n. You might, for example, do the unitary group un, um, which is contained in gln of the complex numbers. And the big problem with writing down a measure on the unitary group is actually writing down coordinates for the unitary group. Um, and there are several ways of writing down coordinates. One way is to use the Cayley parameterization. And for this, we can write some elements of the unitary group U as in the form I plus IH times I minus IH. So this gives a sort of coordinate patch for the unitary group here. This is unitary. And this is a Hermitian matrix. And this is the identity matrix. Um, so this gives a coordinate coordinates for an open neighborhood of the identity in terms of emission matrices. Um, and um, now that the, the Hermitian matrices are an open subset of a vector space. In fact, they are just a vector space. So we can use the previous method of fitting around the, with the Jacobian to find um, a measure. And in this case, the measure is going to be dH, where this is, um, this is Lebesgue measure on the um, Hermitian matrices and we have to divide it by a suitable Jacobian and if you sit down and calculate it it turns out to be um, debt of i plus h squared to the n if I've got everything right. Um, so here this, this thing is just a suitable Jacobian. Um, so I'll just finish with um, an example I'll sort of leave as an exercise. So here for this example, let's take the group of all um, matrices x11, x12, x13, x22, x23, and x33, 0, 0, 0, um, with x11, x22, and x33 is greater than 0. So the left, inv so, so the left invariant measure is going to be dx11 op2 dx33 all divided by x11 cubed x22 squared x33 to the power of 1. I hope I've got this the right way around. So the exercise is to check that this is the left invariant measure and to find the right invariant measure. This is one of the cases where the left invariant measures and the right invariant measures are not the same. Okay, next lecture I'll be discussing the difference between the left invariant measure and the right invariant measure in more detail and it's related to something called the modular function of the Lie group.